Hey guys, so before this episode starts, I want to let you know I'm here in Michigan. It's January 4th. It's really, really windy and really snowy. And um, the video for my end of it didn't turn out the way that I wanted it to. I didn't want to do a re-record of it because it wouldn't be genuine. Um, something I love about this channel is nothing is scripted. I don't know anybody's answers before they come on the show. Um, and so I didn't want to re-record and have it be not genuine. So as you're watching it and my screen is freezing up and stuff, the audio is fine. And I hope you guys can get past the frozen screen. But for you and for me and for Gory, I wanted things to be as genuine as possible. So that's why I didn't re-record it with a better video because it wouldn't be genuine. It wouldn't be real. And that's what I love about my first horror movie is it's all real. So um, I hope you can forgive the video issues that I had on my end. Uh, watch Gory. She's amazing. She's beautiful. And she's very knowledgeable. Um, so I just wanted to give you that little disclaimer before you started watching this video. I'm so sorry that it turned out the way it did. But I love this interview. I love the way it went. So I hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you. Welcome back to Sledgehammer Horror, guys. I am Ken Sledge, and let's talk horror. Today, I am joined by the beautiful Gory B Movie. How are you doing today? Wonderful. How are you? I am doing so good. I am so glad to have you here. Um, before we get into this, everybody, you've probably noticed a little bit of a change of scenery here. Uh, Kenley, my two-year-old, is not feeling very well, so she's sleeping in Daddy's bed tonight. So Daddy had to move studios over to son kenny's room so that's why we have this little change of scenery here it won't last long i promise but um gory i want to talk a little bit real quick about you before we get into the reason why we're here um she has a youtube channel called gory b movie and you don't have to search for it it's down here in the description so make sure you're clicking the links down here following her on social media as well as subscribing to the youtube channel um at the youtube channel she reviews horror movies with an emphasis on b movies cult classics and forgotten favorites um, also created a series called All the Gory Details, where she gives deep dives with loads of behind the scenes info, and another series called Real vs. Real. This is one of my favorites, where she looks at movies that are based on a true story. Now, not only that, but she does live streams as well. Also has, it's the woman of horror, Ghoul's Night Out, which is super rad. I got a girl, a good, a, not a girlfriend, a good friend of mine named Anna. Um, what a ghoul wants on YouTube. I think you guys will make an awesome stream sometime. Awesome. Um, now, Again, all the social media links, the YouTube links, they're all down here in the description, but you do a whole lot, Glory. So I want you to explain to us. I know I didn't cover everything that you do, but if there's anything you could tell us about some of the stuff that you do over at the channel and some of the other things that you're a part of, I know we'd all love to hear it. Well, I started on Horror Addicts with my husband and my son. We're just a little spooky family that does all things horror. So I'm still on there. We do a lot of uh, new release horror stuff, which is not so much what I do on my channel. On my channel, I really like to celebrate movies that I think are wonderful that maybe you haven't missed. Or in the case of movies like Grizzly 2, movies that are maybe not so wonderful, but they're interesting. And I love to give tons of trivia and facts because I can't remember my own phone number, but I can remember a lot of stuff about horror movies, and I love to share that, and I love to celebrate all areas of horror. I love to show appreciation for movies that don't get a lot of love, and I, with the women of horror thing, I just think it's wonderful because especially when I came on here back in 20, 2015, not only was there not a lot of horror channels, but there was almost no other women, you know, it was me and a few other girls, so it's like, you know, and a lot of the channels are very, uh, with their reviews, they're obviously very directed to a male audience. You know, the ones that will give you like the whole like nudity count, but I'm like, hey, hey, where's the male nudity in this count? You know, obviously they're directing it to a male audience. So I just wanted to celebrate my love of horror with other women and kind of give a female perspective. And I do that on Ghoul's Night Out and I do that on Freaky Girls Live over on that channel. We just have a lot of fun. Yeah. And what I love about horror is, it's all inclusive um unfortunately obviously you still get a little bit of gatekeeping and shit with it just like everything else but overall it's very accepting of everybody it doesn't matter if you're male female gay straight black white it, it really doesn't matter you want to talk about freddie you know we're going to say welcome to prime time bitch and we're going to dive right into it and that's what i love about the horror community is i've never met a person that left a bad taste in my mouth um and it is, I have a lot of friends that are female that are in the horror genre, and it's really unfortunate how women still get that side eye almost when it comes to horror stuff. And um, we're starting to do away with that. I mean, horror back in the 70s, it created the final girl. You could even make the argument in the 60s. Women have always been 
very empowered in the horror genre and they've always been at the top of the food chain in the horror genre. So I've never understood the sideways looks at women because when we talk about the most iconic people in horror, when we're talking about villains, we're mostly talking about men. We're talking about heroes. We're mostly talking about women, our final girls. Our final girls are always kicking the shit out of the men, even That's in the movies that we watch. So what drew me to horror, even as a kid, is my mother was always reading Stephen King. My mother was always watching horror movies. And I was always really interested, with, especially if it was a young girl my age, like a little <laughs> kid, like just, you know, like Daniel Harris in the Halloween movies. I'm like, oh, she's like me, you know, and you want, you want that representation and horror has always had such great female representation. Yes. It's always been ahead of the curve when it comes to social issues, in my opinion, um, whether it's race issues, wealth issues, sex issues, horror has always been not afraid to tackle it head on. So, um, and horror think- does it in a way that's so much more fun than I think some other genres, because usually it's a metaphor so you could watch something like uh like recently get out and you can watch it as kind of a stepford wives type horror movie and you don't need to get any of the social commentary it's fine it's still completely enjoyable without it but if you want that if you want that message it's there you know and usually Mm -hmm. with any kind of horror movie you have that you have movies like ginger snaps like it could just be a werewolf movie for you and that's fine but there's also Mm -hmm. a lot of commentary about growing up and being a teenage girl so you get so yeah. much more out of your movie than a movie that's just preaching to you. Exactly. And that's what I love. I lo- like, I look at the people under the stairs is another big one where um, you're not punching me in the face with a message. You're a horror movie first with a message. And we'll, just like you just ex- described it, you don't have to focus on the message. If you want it, it's there, but you're a horror movie first. You're not, you know, I'm not watching a preacher, to, you know, like, like you said, you, you worded it so perfect. Then it's amazing that we can be on the same wavelength when it comes to this type of stuff. So, Gory, the reason that we're here, we know that how much you're into horror. And I do want to remind everybody because the opening credits just ran. We're getting ready to start now. So I want to remind you before we do, links in the description. Please follow her on social media. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel. And I've said it before. I'm going to say it again. Not for me, not for her, but for yourself. I would never bring anybody on here to talk to them if I didn't think they made dog shit stuff. So obviously she makes great content and I'm very excited to have her here when she agreed to come on. I was super stoked. So horror has to start somewhere for all of us, Lori. And now I want to take it back to the past. Talk about what got you started in the horror genre, your first horror movie and your first horror movie was. Okay. That's a little bit of a dodgy question because my parents are avid horror freaks, like avid. And I, they were watching horror movies around me before I was even aware of what they were doing. Like American Werewolf in London came out when I was really young. I know that was a big deal. They watched that. But the first, I chose the first one that I actually remember, that I remember sitting down and watching and being so excited about. I mean, like, can we watch that again? Because that was amazing. And that was? That was... The original Fly, um, the one with Vincent Price. Uh, shoot, I, what year was it? 1958. They came out in 1958. 1958. Yes. Yes. What so, an amazing um, film. It's so amazing. And, you know, back in the day, uh, to our younger people who are watching, back in the day, there wasn't really streaming. And um, VHS, God, I sound so old. VHS was still pretty new. So like, I remember when we first got a VHS player, like that was, that was new. And so a lot of the horror movies we'd watch would come on TV. And my mom knew that I loved Vincent Price. Like, even if I wasn't into the movie, I'd be like, oh, it's him. I love him. You know, we watched a whole bunch of his movies and she would always be like, you know, hey, come on, come on we're going to go watch this movie. But uh, yeah, he's in this movie and this That's one that. really stuck with me like it still sticks with me i watch it all the time i love this movie also this set by the way from shout factory amazing it has all the minutes it looks great it's got uh the original it's got return of the fly curse of the fly the cronenberg remake one of the best remakes of all time and then the tv follow-up to that one fly two yes with eric stoltz um and it's funny you just brought up the remake. A question I ask it, and you know, we're going to ask this question now since we're already on that subject. Um, a question I always ask is, would you like to see this movie remade today? Now, you had the David Cronenberg remake, which I consider more of a, of a hard reboot because it does take some of what the 1958 Fly did 
but it also I feel like um, Cronenberg's is a, is a whole lot different in a whole lot of different ways too. And it's all to me one of the most perfect remakes for that reason. I love when a remake takes the original idea and metamorphosizes it into its own story, which is what Cronenberg did and had some of the best practical effects of all time. There's no reason Would you to, like to see if you're just going to tell the same story, like the Cabin Fever remake, that was completely pointless. <laughs> Unless you're going to do yep. something different with it. And I think it's it's best when the filmmaker is excited because they love the original and they're like, what if we did this? Mm -hmm. and that's what Cronenberg and That's did. what I love about Cronenberg's. Now, would you like to see a remake today of the, not the Cronenberg fly, but the 1958 Vincent Price fly? Would you like to see them try to do a remake of that type of version today? Yes, only for one small reason. Um, this film is nearly perfect. And I say nearly just because, unfortunately, this came out during the Hayes Code. The Hayes Code was a period of time in American cinema where there were certain rules about morality, which is so confusing when it comes to horror movies, because that shouldn't be a bit, that, that should be pushed aside, because you're talking about some pretty gritty stuff. And with that, that meant that there was a lot of rules, even with non-horror movies. Like if you were the femme fatale in a movie, now all of a sudden you had to die. You can't, you can't just let them get away with that. Well, the haze could affected the fly in one way that I just really hate. And at the end of the movie, it's a dark movie. It's really dark. But at the end of the movie, we get this like feel good message at the end and it doesn't fit. It just doesn't fit. I don't want a feel good message. It should, it should end with just looking at the man's son and going, this isn't over yet, is it? You know, because now he is inspired to continue his dad's work. And that's a really dark, scary place. And it, it has a dark, scary message about, you know, what we do with science and when we go too far. And it should have left you thinking about that. Instead, it's just like, well, movie's over. Not a big fan of that part of it. I also think, you know, we do have better effects nowadays. I hate how a lot of people dismiss this movie as cheesy because the effects weren't um they don't compare to Cronenberg's but I think 1958 they were compared to 1986 that's not fair it's just not yeah and people like you know even I think it's ridiculous when the, he's in the web and he's like help me help me but it did creep me out as a kid so it was effective but if you did that same story and you remade it with better effects I also think the most fascinating part of the story is it's kind of a a, a love triangle story I mean, you have a yeah. great love story between the husband and the wife, the husband who's the scientist who's turned himself into a fly, and this woman who did the absolute hardest thing in the world to protect him. And then you also have this really interesting character played by Vincent Price, uh, Francois, who is uh, his brother. And it's so painful for this poor man because he's in love with his brother's wife, and he's resigned himself to being a bachelor for the rest of his life because he's already fallen in love with somebody and he can't. He can't get over that, but he's a gentleman, so he would never, ever do anything about it. And now he's pulled into this whole situation because, you know, his brother's been been killed and he's trying to protect them and stuff. But it's just such a fascinating character. I would love that character to get more um, exploration. And it, that's one of the things about this movie that always touched me. Like, even when he is the fly and he goes over to that chalkboard. And he writes, I love you on it. And then he falls and almost erases it. You know, like, you know, it, he still loves her. Like, no matter what's happened, it's for you. You know what I mean? Like, and the, I, that's a scene that's probably one of my favorite scenes in the whole movie. Um, I just love, I think it's su such a hard hitting scene. I'm a softie as it, as it is anyway, but um, we're kind of touching on these scenes now. But what scene would you say it was that affected you the most from this movie? I guess as a kid, it would be the one where he's in the spiders. But one, because I am so afraid i can't i watched the amazing spider-man with my son the other day and i'm like like covering my eyes because i can't handle when spiders drop down I, ooh, uh, uh, so the spider in that web scared the crap out of me that really scared me um and then the man with with the head you know the human head who with the fly body stuck in there that really creeped me out So I guess yeah. that's the most iconic scene in the movie and the one that stuck with me a lot. Also, there's a scene that really upset me as a kid when Dandelo just, just, where does Dandelo go? 
like my I watched it with my son and he calls it God Cat because essentially Dandelo, the cat, is put into the machine <laughs> and yeah. he just vaporizes into nothing. And then you still hear his meowing. So my son thought that was hilarious. But when I was a kid, I thought that was horrifying. And it really made me think a lot about where do we go when we die? And did that cat go there? And it had it left me with a lot to think about when I was like, I don't know, what, six when I watched this? So Yeah. Well, and you're talking about when you were talking, one thing I wanted to bring up when you're talking about that spider web scene, it's so dark too, how he just picks up that rock and then he just crushes them with that rock. You're just like, what the hell just happened? Did that, did they really just do that? So they, I mean, like there's so, and I feel like this movie, like you said earlier, gets a bad rep because of the, the Cronenberg remake. And that's so not fair because these really look, they're based on the same story. But these are really two completely different movies, and you have to really watch them both with different lenses because they're not doing the same thing and they're not portraying the same effect. They're, I'm not effect, but like the whole story is different. Like yes, they're it has the same meat on the bones, but it's so different. They're about completely different things. The Fly is a kind of murder mystery. It's a love story, mm -hmm. and it's mostly about the dangers of science, like. Can we take science too far to where um, it, it does more harm than good? You know, it, yeah. and that's that was a big theme in the 50s. They were really scared because we had all these technological developments. And it's like, are we getting ahead of ourselves? Um, completely different than Cronenberg's The Fly. Um, it's about, as Cronenberg put it, it's about that horror of old age. When you grow mm -hmm. old and your body is changing and falling apart and you're losing your teeth and you're losing your eyesight and you're becoming somebody that's not who you thought you were and that degradation and I think it can also be compared to like during the time of the 80s a lot of people thought it was about AIDS which it absolutely does fit that it can compare to somebody watching somebody succumb to cancer it's yeah. that losing control of your body the horror of that because he's all about the body horror and he touched on it perfectly well it also does have a lot of that romance and so Whereas the fly, it's about are would you be willing to kill somebody like humanely if you loved them? And that movie actually is one of the few that gives you a real good justification about it. it she has to kill her husband to protect their son. She doesn't, he doesn't want his son to know what happened to him. And so she needs to crush the arm that was turned into a fly and his head. And that's the most painful thing in the world to do. And she's going to be punished for it. She's going to, she yeah. gets sent to an insane asylum in the, in the story, uh, the movie, they kind of gloss over it, but right, it's, right. that's a huge sacrifice to make for somebody that you love and she's willing to do it. And then at the end, when they crush him with a the rock, they, again, they realize it's the only humane thing to do. And Cronenberg's, that's the one thing that really does carry over well is this person is in so much pain and they, they're not who they were anymore, you know, right. and she eventually has to let go of him. And it's one of those things where, again, we're talking about two separate stories, but could you imagine having to kill the person that you love more than anything to protect the person that you created that you love more than anything, but to also protect this person? This can't get out. And like while we're talking about this, when you have that reveal of the fly head and you have the camera, you know, with the fly eye lens, like that's another really good scene in this movie that is not as appreciated as it should be you know he looks it's very for 1958 this scene looks really good the scenes of him like trying to eat dinner with like the the cloth over his head and stuff i thought that was really good too because it's also i mean again you have to remember this is the 50s you had to present a certain face to the world you know so he's yeah. still trying to use utensils he's still trying to be what's considered to be a gentleman he's still trying to be part of polite society but he obviously cannot be right and it's really sad watching him trying to struggle to be this person that he was and, and that's another thing like I, there's no going back now and that's another thing in this movie that you know there's always this fear of impending doom because what's gonna you, you can't go back you know there's there's no way that this is gonna end well so you always have that, you know, that fear that, you know, this is going to, this isn't going to end very well. You know, that's happening throughout the whole film and well, I'll be damned if it didn't. And that's, I think why that, that touch on at the end, the feel good ending, which is delivered not even by one of the main characters in the movie. I'm like, who the hell are you, dude? 
Um, <laughs> that's why it kind of bugs me. Um, I, if you had maybe Vincent Price or somebody with a more somber tone, um, wrap it up, I guess it would have been better. But I was just like, this is such a dark movie. We don't need the feel good Hallmark ending here. Like this right. is dark. And I think something else I would have liked to see touch on, touched on if they did a remake is the father, the, the scientist, he wants his head and his arm destroyed because he obviously doesn't want anyone to know what he did to himself. But his biggest reason, he doesn't want his kid to find out. You yeah. know, he wants his kid to remember him as dad, as the man he was. The thing is, if his kid knew what happened to him, he would, the, the second movie is all about his, what his son does as an adult. If his right. son knew as a child, maybe that wouldn't have happened. That's true. He would have maybe been able to learn more about what happened and have the education of why it turned out the way it did. Because, I mean, the movie's a lot about the dangers of science. Sometimes horrible things happen as we explore the boundaries of science and we, we work to push those boundaries. Sometimes really bad things happen. That's why we have so many systems in place to try to stop that from happening. You know, things that yeah. are supposed to protect animals and human beings. But sometimes that gets pushed so far and then something horrible like in this movie happens. And I think if we don't look at the dangers or the results, or if we just try to forget those things or we gloss over them, then we're doomed to repeat those mistakes. And I think honestly the kid probably should have known that and he doesn't yeah. in the story like his mom gets sent to a mental institution and stuff so it's just like and i think she ends up i think she kills herself um it's been a while since i read it but yeah i think the child deserved to know and i think it well, been say, at, least, at least he had a happy life yeah well yeah <laughs> <laughs> i don't know the second one's so funny because he turns a guy into like a guinea pig man <laughs> that Oh, and then the third one's the one with Vincent Price, right? I know. You want Okay, here's something really funny I want to say about this movie. So this movie one is really, um, really special to me because not only was it, uh, my mom, I remember she sat me down and said, this is important. This is an important movie. And, you know, so like I had my attention and she, you know, she said that she loved it. It was one of her favorites. But she also said it was important because it was the first movie her mother introduced to her at about oh. my age. I was about I think it was about four. And in turn, it was the first movie I introduced to my son. And I did the same thing. I was like, this is like a family tradition here. I'm, I'm passing on something to right. you. So uh, I know you're four, but, you know, grab your juice box and sit down and get ready for something awesome. Grab your ecto cooler and let's roll. Yeah. But here's the funny thing. So when I think about this movie and I think about it, in my head, it's black and white. And I don't know why, because this movie was filmed in color. Mm -hmm. I, I bought it on Blu-ray about however many years ago, and it said it was in color. I'm like, oh, I want the black and white one that I remember from watching as a kid. And then I researched it, and I'm like, it was filmed in color. So I don't know if we had a black and white TV or something, but yeah. Or it could just be one of those, like, um, Mandela effect things. Mandela. Like, yeah, it could be. <laughs> <laughs> My mother also says she remembers it in black and white. So I think it's like one of those Berenstein Bears things. Yeah. You know? very bizarre god damn you nelson mandela <laughs> look i'm telling you i totally remember a fucking wizard or genie movie with uh Sinbad, okay like yeah. i totally remember it like i remember it perfectly does that not exist because i i remember that too no it doesn't there is no movie where Sinbad -uh, played I'm the genie. Sinbad. yeah it was Shaq that played the genie it was shazam I well, remember, I remember one, a Sinbad one. Sinbad. Sinbad never did one? Never did one. What the heck? That's some, somebody did some timey wimey wibbly wobbly stuff and changed that because I remember it too. So do I, like the pants and everything, man. We just, for people that don't know about the Mandela effect, we probably just ruined your life. Because so now you're going to research it for so, I did. I went down that rabbit hole so far. But, Gory, we know how horror started for you we talked about your first horror movie and what that means to you but now i want to go scream on you here for a second my little buddy ghostface has a question for you what's okay. your favorite scary movie gory what is your favorite horror movie of all time uh my favorite horror movie of all time uh <laughs> my favorite movie of all time is who framed roger rabbit and it's got some horrific parts in it but no that's not a horror movie my favorite horror movie of all time, probably Friday Night. I think that is a perfect movie. I think it's a movie 
that was made for people who love horror. I watched it at yeah. a very young age with the biggest crush on Chris Sarandon. Man, that man just oozes sex appeal. Um, oh my God. I related to all of the characters in it because they loved horror movies. And it's just such a great vampire story. It's funny. It has everything, everything. And I've rewatched it so many times I can't even count. And it still holds up. It's still amazing. And it's kind of a tie because my other favorite movie, I recognize that it has a few flaws. I do. There's some things I wish were changed, but The Craft. I'm a witch. I love The Craft. I watched it when I was in high school at the movie theater and it blew me yeah. away. I'd never seen like an accurate, like close to accurate. I mean, they made up some stuff, the Mano stuff. Like, what is that? But they actually had like real stuff in there. Like it was really cool. And to this day, I think it's one of the most accurate portrayals of actual witchcraft I've ever seen. My only complaint, my only complaint what did they do to Bonnie and Rochelle at the end of the movie? Like they were such a big part of the movie. And then the third act, they just kind of disappear. They're just like, like uh, bad, they're, they're backup bad guys. That's all they are. So right. they got kind of a disservice at the end there. I recognize that it's still one of my favorite movies. I watch it. Right. All the time. Well, see, and you were talking about Fright Night. Evil, Evil Ed is one of my favorite characters in cinema history, you know? Like, all his one-liners are so... You know, Mother says dinner is in the oven. You know, like, that guy is fucking so priceless, so good, so... Um, I named my dog after that movie. My dog's name is name Brewster. It? That's awesome. Like, you're, you're so, so cool, Brewster. Brewster. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. That's my dog's oh. name. So, Gory, I've had so much fun with you talking about The Fly, talking about your favorite horror movie. So I always end these with the same question. We're going back to The Fly 58. And what we're doing is we're ranking this on a skull count. Now, we're not going to be critics. We're not judging it on score, on effects, on acting, nothing like that. What we're doing is strictly a, judging this movie on how much it affected you. So zero skulls, not effective. Five, very effective. Anywhere in the middle, and you can use half and quarter skulls. What would your ranking of Vincent Price's The Fly be? For how much it affected me? Yes. Definitely a five. I mean, I think about this movie all the time. And I, <laughs> I, I to this day, I still think it's one of the most romantic movies I've ever seen. I know that's such a bizarre thing to say about a movie where a woman puts her husband into a, a industrial press, but mm hot -hmm. damn is this movie ever romantic? Horror knows to be romantic while being, I mean, look at all, like, honestly, like we were talking about the, the David Cronenberg's The Fly. Um, look at Candyman. Look oh. at American Werewolf in London. You know, so yes. I think American Werewolf in London is one of the best love stories of all time. Even though it's Absolutely. a horror movie, you know, such a great nurse, Alex and David, like that's a fucking great love story. And those, those movies fly, American Werewolf in London, Candyman, and those movies have a happy ending. You know, the best love stories don't always end happily. You look at those movies and they're probably some of the darkest endings in movie history but they're also some of the greatest love stories in cinema history as well so i will say horror and i consider it to be horror i think we also have the healthiest relationship ever and it belongs to our genre genre is morticia and gomez like that's goals yeah yes 100 percent. gomez would i mean like i would die for her i would kill for her <laughs> either way let's have some fun you know what i mean like that's that's what it is you know like horror and romance are so closely connected that it's you know that that absolute feeling of euphoria you get from being scared or being in love that are they really that much different you know and i think that's why we remember our first horror movie so well we get that drug you know we get that high and then we're constantly chasing that dragon again trying to get that fear back and that's why i feel like our first horror movie is so important to us whether it's positive or negative i've said this story before on here but I have a good friend and his first horror movie was Nightmare on Elm Street for the a long time. But not, he absolutely refused to sleep with sheets on his bed because of the Jesu Garcia scene in the jail. Like that fucked him up so bad. He oh. sleep with sheets on his bed. So horror can, you can either fall in love with it the first time you see it. It can completely fuck you up the first time you see it. It's just, that's what I love about this and the ability. I've had people on the show that are like, look, I don't like horror movies, and it's because of this. Let's talk about it, and boom, we go right into the ring, or you know what I mean, like whatever. Like people, 
get fucked up and they just they steer away from it because it scares them so bad. And even then, I love to talk about it. I want to know what makes you tick. I want to know why it means to you. I don't know if you know this or not, but my parents owned a video store growing up. So that's I grew cool. up in the horror section. Like that's what I did growing up was walking up and my YouTube was walking up and down the aisles, looking at the cover cases and trying to decide what I was going to rent based on the art on the cover. That's Fright awesome. Night. I used to work in a video store back in the day. Nothing like that smell, awesome. man. If you, if you know, you know, the video store smell, nothing like it. Oh, I knew so many movies just by their covers. Mm-hmm. Like remember Frankenhooker where you could push it and it would talk to you. Yeah. And then you had, um, like I said, Fright Night was another one. Um, but always and forever, the best cover art, no matter what. And I'll fight this to the death. My favorite horror movie, my first horror movie, House. Ding dong, you're dead. So good. So good. And that movie has so many themes in it. Such a good pick. My mother showed me that one, too, because she's awesome. Yeah, that's so that good. was my first. Like that's what And really... what I love about horror is I feel like I could watch a romance movie and what am I going to get? I'm going to maybe get some drama and I'm going to get romance. I could watch a comedy movie and I'm going to laugh, but that's all I'm getting from a horror movie. So many horror movies give you comedy, romance, obviously horror, action. Yeah. Like so many horror movies give you so much. So why yeah. just get the equivalent of a, a burger when you can get burger fries and the whole meal deal from a horror movie that's going to give you such a bigger experience? And usually go. horror is the one that's exploring themes in ways that no other genre can, because there is that safety in making it an allegory about like monsters or something, but it sticks with you. You get such, I feel like such a greater value from horror movies. I hate when people kind of dismiss them as always being the same thing because horror horror is the one genre where every single year I find something that I've never seen before that surprised me. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the thing. Horror is also the most, you were just talking about the most objective genre. Like, when it comes to comedy, you make me laugh. It's a comedy. When it comes to drama, if you make me feel something, it's a drama. Horror? Like, you can't say, oh, it's got to have death. Bambi has death. It's not a horror movie. It's got to scare me. Who framed Roger Rabbit? When I killed your brother, he looked <laughs> like this. I have never cried harder than when that poor toon shoe died. Like, never. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, like, we, we just did a thing on our channel where it was the top 10 scary moments from non-horror movies. You know, there are plenty of movies that have terrifying moments. The never-ending story when Artex is drowning in the, the sadness swamp. Uh, Pee-wee's Big Adventure, Large Marsh. Blah, that. You know, you Return to these. Oz is one that's not a horror movie, but that scared the hell out of me. I was watching yes. all these horror movies. And my mother said the first one I ran out of the room on was Wizard of Oz. And it wasn't because of the witch. Apparently, I was freaked out by the munchkins. But I think it's their weird little overalls. And I don't know. See, for me in the Wizard of Oz, it was the, the monkeys. The flying monkeys. See? That terrified me it got me i I could i think that the first movie i ever that scared me so bad i had to shut it off honestly was casino and we talked about that when they uh when they beat um joe pesci and his brother in that cornfield and they're just beating him with the baseball bat he's like please he's done he's dead kill him he's still breathing like that fucked me up so bad as a kid i was like i can't do this 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 is really scaring me so um, we're at the third act now, guys. The end credits are about to roll. So before we do that, we got to get back to the meat of this. The links are down here in the description. So make sure you're clicking these links, subscribing to the YouTube, following on social media. I promise you, you will not regret it. So Gory, don't go anywhere. I got a couple more questions for you. Everybody else, as always, keep talking horror, stay what you are, and we'll see you guys soon.